Thank you very much. Uh, before, before I share, uh, I had this in the first service, had a picture of a nose area, and I've always asked, Lord, what are you trying to show us? And I feel like the Lord's saying that there are a lot of people that have uh, all kinds of sinus and nasal problems. God wants to heal that uh, this morning. I also feel like that there may be some of you have lost smell because of COVID, and I think he wants to return that. And I think there's even, it's a, but it's real, it's more than, than just physical, it's spiritual. God wants us to have a greater sense of, of discernment. And, you know, it's like you talk about sniffing things out. Listen, he wants to give that. So if you're here or online, you're having any troubles with your nasal sinus area, put your hands on your nose and your sinuses. If you've lost smell, Lord, we just believe in the name of Jesus for a complete restoring of the entire sinus breathing area. The breath of God come. Come Holy Spirit and just release the healing power of God in all of our noses and sinuses, all the area around the head and the eyes. And Lord, I'm asking you not only did you bring healing, but Lord, you would release a new level of discernment. Now ask him, just say, you heal my nose and heal my sinus areas. Come, Holy Spirit, let the breath of God just breathe in to each and every one of us. And Lord, help us to have a discernment that's way beyond what we've had. So Lord, we love you and we bless you and we just thank you and we believe you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, some of you may need to just to breathe and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for breath. Um, I, wanted, I do want to encourage you about next steps. Yeah, we've, we haven't done this before. Where this is brand new. If you're new here, we really want you to come. We recognize it's going to be at this service. Next week is for four weeks. You may say, well, I don't want to miss the service. I'd come at 9.30. <laughs> you can come at 9.30, have a service. You can come at next steps. And we obviously have it online. But we recognize that it's not, there's not any time that's convenient. And we just felt like it was important enough. And like Pastor Chris shared what we're, we're not trying to rehash old stuff. We're trying to say, okay, we're moving into a whole new realm. We are serious about making disciples. And we want to help you discover how do we really, how do we see that happening here? I mean, when we began the church uh, a long time ago, uh, we kept saying, people said, what's the vision of the church? What's the mission of the church? And you know, well, how can it be different than what the Bible says? Go make disciples. I mean, how do you come up with something different than what God already said, go do? And so it's been a challenge from the very beginning. We can't really make disciples. So what we're trying to do is to help us have a clear direction. Okay, this is what next steps means. This is what do you do. What do you do next? This is what you need to do. And so it's going to be very clear. So I just want to encourage you. Um, you may have been here for years. You still don't know what are you supposed to do next. You need to come next steps. So I want to encourage you. We're going to do this on the, we're going to start on the first Sunday of each month. We're going to run four weeks. And so I just want to encourage you, if you may not be able to come this next time, we'll come the next time. If you miss one, you can come to one of those that you missed. But it, it is going to be important, I think, for all of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, like I said earlier, when we started this, we, our little catchphrase was making disciples who make a difference. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we make a difference? I don't know of any of you here that, <clears throat> or anybody watching, it, you don't want to make a difference. Everybody wants to make a difference in life because that's what God really put in us. He wants us to, there's something significant about us. We're not just here occupying space and time and we're, we're hoping to make it out someday. No, we're supposed to, we're, God created us for a reason. So how do we really make a difference? And that's really what I want to talk about today. There's a principle, a kingdom principle. And by the way, we've been talking about the kingdom of God on Wednesday nights. So if you've not been able to come on Wednesday nights, I encourage you to watch our Wednesday night live on the uh, YouTube. You can go back and follow what we've been sharing. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. He demonstrated the kingdom of God. He was more than just words. He said the kingdom of God doesn't come in just words, it comes in power. And so that was his message that needs to be ours. Now, so I want to talk about today a principle, it's a kingdom principle, that will help us make a difference in our life. You want to make a difference? Yeah, I think all of us want to make a difference. Okay, if you turn, 
if you were to Luke chapter 6. This is a verse that you've probably heard many times if you've been in church. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you. Now, this is a kingdom principle that, and, and we're going to look at it from different aspects here, but this is something that's so very important. Eight words that can change your life. Do you believe that? Give, and it will be given to you. This is a principle of the kingdom of God that God has given to us to help us. You know, we can change our world, and we can change the world around us. We always want to make a difference. This is how you make a difference. Start right here. Understand this principle and apply it in your life. So he says, give, and it will be given to you. The promise. How will it be given? Good measure. Shaken down. Running over. See, it's multiplied back. That's why this is such a huge principle. The principle is that if you give, whatever you give, it's going to come back multiplied into your life. And then it says, whatever measure you use it, it's going to be measured back to you. God is literally saying, look, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to put into your hands. This is a kingdom principle that if you will embrace it and, and allow the scriptures to guide you and direct you, you start giving and it's going to be given back to you. It's going to come back multiplied. It's called the law of reciprocity, actually. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So the point is, is that he's given something to us, put into our hands, that we can actually see our lives change and we can see the world around us change. And do you believe that? Yes. And we're going to look at that today. Now, this is good and bad. This is a good principle and it's a bad principle. It depends on what you're sowing. What are you giving? But we need to be giving according to what God tells us to give. Because whatever you give, you're going to get. It's going to come back to you. So it's very, very important we recognize. Now, I'm not talking about, please hear me, I'm not talking about some, you know, new works program or, or something to try to gain God's pleasure in this. What I'm talking about is learning God's ways. I'm not talking about going to heaven here. We're talking about learning how to live and operate according to his principles here on earth. Listen, the salvation issue, if you're born again, you're going to heaven. But listen, he wants us to learn how to live here, how to cooperate with his kingdom Remember, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So he wants us to learn how to operate in his ways and see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. God himself adheres to his own principles. John three sixteen, Again, a very familiar scripture. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved so much he gave. He gave the greatest gift that could ever be given. So his heart is, is that we would have that same love and out of love, we would give. And he wants us to give properly, but this is the principle. God himself adheres to his own principle. He loved and he gave. And Jesus gave by going to the cross and dying for us. So the principle is not just a principle for, you know, like, oh my goodness. No, it's God's plan from the beginning, and he himself lived by it. Think of this. It says, if a seed bides alone, it does nothing. But if it falls to the earth and dies, what happens? It produces a huge crop. Do you understand that Jesus was the seed that was planted and came out of that tomb? You know, and there was 120 in the upper room. Later, there were 3,000, and there were 5,000, and now there's over a billion-plus souls all over the face of the earth. Folks, that's a harvest. Give, and it will be given to you. Now, again, it's not about getting. So please hear me. I'm going to say that a number of times. It's not about getting. It's about giving. It's not about how much I get. It's about how can I give. It's a real subtle deal because here's the real problem. John 10, 10 says that we have a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and might have it more abundant. So what we have here, we have, we have an enemy that is trying 
to steal and kill. What is that? He's a taker. He's always trying to get something. Jesus said he came that you might have life and might have it more abundant. So God is a giver. So God is a giver. The devil is a taker. And so it's so clear that in that one passage, you can see the dynamics of what we're talking about here. God says, look, I want you to give, and it will be given to you. Now, this is the principle, so it's very important we understand that it's not just, you know, just some kind of random deal. Go with me to Genesis chapter 8. This is after the flood. And just one little verse here, verse 22. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest... Cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Now, last time I checked, the earth was still here. Okay? So are the seasons. So what his point is, is that even in the natural, this is the principle that God set in motion in the earth. That when you plant a seed, you're going to get a harvest. Now, granted, I I grew up on the farm, so we plant it all the time. Uh, and not everything comes up. But the, but the point here is, is as long as the earth remains, as long as there's different seasons, see, you plant a seed, you're going to get a harvest. Now, here's, the, here's the, again, principle. This is in the natural. And we were talking that, that other one's in the spirit primarily. But you plant a one seed, you don't expect to get a one seed back. Now, you plant a corn seed, you, can plan, you plan to get a stalk that's going to produce multiple ears with multiple corn, you know, kernels on that, that stalk. So that God built this in. So when we talk about give and it'll be given to you, we're not talking about some kind of weird deal. No, this is, the, this is a, a principle in the natural. It's a principle in the spirit. Now go with me all the way over to uh, Galatians. And what I want to look at here is in Galatians, Paul is addressing basically the same thing. So we've got Old Testament, and then you've got Jesus, and now we're looking at what Paul says. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he's going to reap. Okay, now here's the point. He said, don't be, God, you know, don't be deceived because God is not mocked. For we can be deceived, and this is how we can be deceived. Think that we're not sowing. Think that you're not giving. I mean, the truth is, we are. And a lot of times, we are totally unaware that, wow, I'm sowing bad seeds. I'm, I'm giving things, or maybe I'm doing good seeds, whatever. But he's saying, don't be deceived, because whatever you sow, you're going to reap. For he who sows to the flesh will the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So he's saying here a couple of things. Number one, don't be deceived in that you're not sowing, because the truth is we are sowing. You may say, well, I don't know if I'm sowing or not, or if I'm giving. Well, you are. And what we need to learn is let's turn it to a positive. Let's don't be you know, passive in this deal. Let's start learning how to give what God says to give, so when we begin to harvest a crop the way God wants us to harvest it. So that's my point here. That when God gives us a principle in the kingdom, he wants us to start applying it and start living it out. Why? So we can change the world around us. Change our world, change those people, change the, the atmosphere everywhere that we go. That's what God is desiring for us to do. So learn how to sow properly. So the question is, what are you sowing? How do you know what you're sowing? How do you know what you're giving? Well, the Bible says that a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. So all you have to do is look at the fruit in your life. What are you experiencing in your life? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If that's it, praise God. But, it, but the principle is so important. Whatever you give... It's going to come back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's going to be poured into your bosom. With the same measure that you used it, it's going to be measured back to you. So that's the principle. And that's what God is wanting us to do. We understand this principle. We can begin to apply it into our lives. And then what's going to happen is you'll see a crop coming back. And you'll say, well, I've done a lot of that. And I haven't seen anything. Well, that's why they put this verse in here. Don't grow weary while doing good. 
because sometimes we have a tendency, well, I, did, I tried that. I did that. You know, and it hasn't happened. He says, in due season, it will happen. You've got to understand, it's in God's season. So you've got to, but, but he will, he's faithful. So you've got to continue to sow, you've got to continue to give, you've got to continue to release the good stuff and not the bad stuff, okay? Now, I want to talk about four ways to apply this into our lives. And if you have your, oh, again, you, the scripture will be there, but I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 6. First place is interpersonal relationships. If you're going to have good relationships, we're going to have to sow good seeds. We're going to have to give into those relationships. You need to give into your marriage. You need to be. You need to give. If you don't give, you, you know. You, you, let me rephrase that. You are giving. You better be checking what you're giving, because you need to recognize it's going to come back. And so, if you, again, please hear me. This principle is powerful. If we'll get this and start giving the correct things, you're going to see a harvest coming back into your life. Now, Luke chapter 6, and again, I pulled this verse right out of the middle of a, of a, a passage here, but I'm going to go to verse 27. He said, but I say to you who hear, I hope we hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, I'm sure that you have that on your refrigerator. That's one of those verses you wake up every day, praise God. I, I, I shared this some, some time ago. I don't know when I, uh, I shared it, but I'm going to share it again for you. We've been uh, connected to Bill Johnson in a group of pastors that meet, and uh, we haven't met in a couple of years just because of COVID, but we were out there a few years ago, and he was telling us that one of the things that he does is that he takes communion every day with his wife. And every day, what he does, he prays through, not only for his own family, but he prays through blessing all of those who hate him. And he said, I have people that write books that hate me. So they, 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 they're not just shy about it. He says, I bless them, I bless their family, I bless their ministry, and I bless them and pray for them. Well, you could have heard a pin drop with a group of pastors. They're going, Wow. I mean, not just, it's not just some words in a book. It's, it's to live out. But the truth is, is that, wow, that's, this is a powerful passage here. And when, we, when you start doing that, you know, people say, but you don't understand what, what people have done to me. And I don't. I've not walked where you've walked. I've not had the things happen. And in, in what's happened to you has happened in my life. But it doesn't change the Word of God. And that's why this is so powerful. I am telling you, this is powerful. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. You start giving that and you'll see lives change. You'll see your life change. Now, I don't know about whatever who hurt you or what they did or anything else, but I'm just telling you, you can change your life. You can make a difference. Verse 35 says, but love your enemies. Now, the whole passage is good. We just don't have time to read it. Love your enemies. Do good and land, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. That's God. You see, he doesn't respond to us according to whether we're good or we're bad. He responds because he's good. He's not sometimes good. He's just good. He loved us while we were still sinners. So it's like, wow, he's, he's good to the unthankful and, and to the evil. Verse 36, therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. <clears throat> Condemn, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And what he's saying here is that if you want to have good relationships, you're going to have to sow and give into those relationships. Obviously, husband and wife relationship, children, parents, people you work with, people you're neighbors with, people we come in contact with. So here's the point. Whatever you do, sow love. Give mercy. Extend grace. Be kind. And whatever you do, do not judge and condemn 
and hold unforgiveness. It'll kill you. You see, what happens is that whatever seed you plant, it's going to come up. I mean, we, I planted lots of seed and prayed for crop failure, but it didn't seem to work. <laughs> you know? So we got to learn how to overseed with good. You know, well, how long? I don't know. Don't grow weary in doing good, for in due season, it will come up. It will produce. How long do I have to do this? You know, you may say, well, I've been doing this. Well, do it some more. Because God's word never returns void. It always accomplishes what it was sent forth to accomplish. So his word is true. So this principle is powerful for interpersonal relationships and for us to have good relationships. You can change the world around you by giving and believing that giving love, giving mercy, giving grace, and extending that to those loved ones, especially those close to you and those people you work with. Amen? Okay, the next one is attitude. I know you love this one. So you can change your attitude. This is a first Thessalon or second Thessalonians. Yep, um, it is First Thessalonians, uh, chapter five, verse sixteen. It says, "Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus for you, in Christ Jesus for you." The point is, is that we should be the most thankful, grateful people on the face of the earth. We should wake up every morning and say, "Thank you, Jesus." For the cross and for the victory that you paid for. You forgave my debt. You've healed my diseases. You've given me life. You've re reconciled me to Father. My debt's been paid. I mean, we can just get up and every morning we need to get up and, and rejoice in that. You say, well, you don't know what I'm going through right now. I don't, but I know what he went through for us. So, I mean, thankful, grateful. We need to start having that kind of an attitude. Do you realize that that one, if you start sowing in, in yourself, saying, I'm going to be thankful, I'm going to be grateful, just like it says in the Old Testament, oh, give thanks, for God is good, for his mercy endures forever. Continually saying that changes your attitude. And when it changes your attitude, it changes everything around you. See, we're supposed to be thermostats. We're not supposed to be thermometers. And we're going around checking the temperature. I don't know if I like that or not. I don't know if I like this. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Hey, how about why don't you change the atmosphere by being a thermostat? Going, I'm going to bring the joy of the Lord into this workplace today. I'm going to, I'm going to change the atmosphere at home. I'm not going to sit around and we're going to have all this depression stuff. I'm going to start worshiping God and praising Him and giving thanks. Uh, you may not be able to change everything. You change you. But I'm the good chance if you change you, you can change that stuff around you. That's what God is wanting us to do. That, wait a minute, I'm not going to. I'm not going to sit back and be and just let the world press into me. Greater is He that lives within me than He that lives in the world. What am I? What am I allowing that to be? Jesus already overcome everything. It's time for me to rise up and say, "Whoa, wait a minute, enough's enough. Let's start moving forward." Good attitude. You can have a great attitude. You imagine what an attitude to do at work. Having a great attitude. I mean, you, you know, can-do attitude, a, a, a thankful attitude, a grateful attitude, everywhere. And that's what God wants to do. Sowing that into our lives is going to cause a harvest to come back. Amen? Okay. The third area is one that we really enjoy. It is we get the opportunity to give money. Now, remember, it says don't be deceived for whatever you sow. He's going to reap. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. The problem is, is that we think that, well, you know, I don't know about money. You know, it'll come back some other way. When I plant corn, I want to get corn. Did you hear that? I don't plant corn and go out there and go, I thought for sure cotton was going to grow. By golly, I don't know why cotton's not growing, because I thought, because... Because you plant corn, you're going to get corn. So, you know, the winters of heaven are not going to open up unless you're giving money. Oh, and by the way, it's not yours in the first place. I love Pastor Chris talking about the other day about his parents giving him money to put in the offering. Well, my parents did me the same way. 
And they'd give me money to put in the offering, and I'd put in the money. And it, it was, I loved doing that. You know why? Wasn't my money. <laughs> but if you keep my money, it became a whole other deal. But see, the truth is, it's not your money now either. It's his. It's all his. And again, it's a principle. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, look, I have, I'm giving you principle. It's not law. People say, well, the tithe went away with the Old Testament. It's the principle. You understand that when you honor God with the first 10%, not after you've done something else, the first 10%, the principle in the Old Testament was that God, he blessed the other nine. So the whole point is, is that it's not about the law, it's a principle. It's a principle of honoring God, acknowledging that you are my source. God causes 90% to go further than you can make 100% go. I've proven it. I've proven every one of these scriptures about money, one way or the other, good and bad. But the point is, he's saying, look, I've given something into your hand. You can change your financial composition. Now, does that mean you're supposed to be rich? No. See, it's got nothing about getting. So when you're still thinking about getting, you're still missing the whole point because it's not about getting, it's about giving. So it's not about, well, I did that. I, I have people, I've had people come up to me and say, well, I, I tithed. And nothing happened. You mean last week you tithed and nothing happened? I mean, what is this, the slot machine? <laughs> you know, it's not... <laughs> This is not Vegas. There's no slot machine here. No, this is the eternal, everlasting kingdom that God is saying, I want you to come in agreement with me. It's not about getting, it's about giving. Once you get across that deal, it's not, I don't even think about what I'm getting. I, my issue is to release. Again, growing up on the farm, we have these ponds. They would catch water. And after in a dry season, they would just shrink and shrink and shrink and get stagnant, nasty. God has not called us to be a pond. He's called us to be to the rivers of living water will flow out of our belly. So what he's, what he's saying is, in another verse in, in Matthew, he sent his disciples out, he said, freely you've received, freely you give. So he wants us to recognize he has already given. He loved us first. We don't make the first move. He's already made the first move. So the point is to learn how to receive. You know how you get more? Release. If you don't release, you can't get more. So what he's saying is give, and it will be given to you. The point is not about how much I get. The point is how much I can give. That's where he's trying to get us. So the whole issue of money, he's saying, look, having money is not a problem. The love of money is a problem because money and your heart are tied together. I want your heart. I don't want money to have you. I want to have your heart. And so, it's, again, this is a principle. That if we learn how to release, it's his money anyway. So once you learn how to release his money, everything changes. Okay, and the last area I want to talk about in this message is, is to give yourself away. Look at Matthew uh, chapter 20. And in this passage, uh, the mother of Zebedee's sons, they came to Jesus and they asked if they could sit on the right or the left. He said, uh, you don't even know what you're asking. Um, it's just not for me to give. That So you can picture this scene. Now Jesus is there. She comes up and, she's, and the disciples are right there. So it's obvious they heard her and what she was saying. You know, and I'm sure you know, they were not happy with it. It says they were not. So in verse 24, and when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. I'm glad they didn't have any interpersonal relational problems. Isn't that true? The reality is that no, you're going to be together, you're going to have issues. Well, they're they're upset. So what did Jesus do? He called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 
will make a difference in this world? Become a servant. Take on the very nature of Jesus himself. Not about what I can get, it's about what I can give. That's what he did. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to lay my life down. And that's what he did. So, what is, so the point here is that if we want to make a difference, become a servant. When you work, think about how I can be a, a better servant and be a blessing to that company or whatever job I'm doing. How can I bless and, and serve in a way that will bring forth everybody is better? How can I improve the quality of the work? How can I help the people around me by having a good attitude is one of them and by having internal personal relationships that are good and blessing people? But all those ways and learning to serve, laying your life down. Jesus laid his life down for us. Laying your life down for one another. Thinking about, okay, Lord, how can I be a better? I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about becoming a doormat. I'm not talking about being involved in an abusive situation. What I'm talking about, though, is a purposeful humbling of yourself and acknowledging that I want to serve and be a blessing. Again, it's not about what I can get. It's about how can I be a blessing. How can I give in a way that benefits those around me? How can, I do the, how can I benefit the company I work for? How can I be a blessing to those people that I'm doing the service for? Whatever. But when we start thinking like that, I'm going to tell you, you start giving and you start serving, it's going to come back to you. And this is what God is saying. This is an opportunity. Give and it will be given to you is a principle of the kingdom of God that absolutely can change your life. And it can change those people around us. Will it make a difference? I do. And I know you do too. This is how we can make a difference. Give. And it will be given to you. Eight words. Eight little simple words. But I pray that God will plant that in our heads. And again, that we will learn how to apply that. Number one, in interpersonal relationships. Number two, in giving thanks. Attitude. And number three, in literally giving money and being rich toward God and allowing the grace of God to be released in our lives. And if it says in 2 Corinthians, it is the grace of God. Um, I mean, a grace of giving. And number three, or number four, the whole issue of giving yourself away. That's what God wants to do. He wants to, he has blessed us. Let me say that again. He has blessed us. We are blessed. And what he was wanting us to do, he loved us first. We didn't first love him. So what he wants us to do is to recognize, get it in here, and then learn how to release it. Receive and then release. Remember I said it's in Matthew chapter 8 when he sent the 12 out. He said, freely you've received, freely you give. 